Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we welcome Carlos Andrade. Thank you. Well, um, we usually start by explaining why do we have our uh, interviewee on the podcast. I've had the uh, distinct pleasure of spending the last 18 months or so in uh, weekly exploration sessions with Carlos, and we found many things um, that we share in terms of interests. Um, I'm certain that uh, the audience will be delighted with the exploration later today. So um, I'll start by inviting Carlos to tell us a little bit about his river of life. Well, thank you, Horia. I must say the pleasure has been mine, and I hope I, I don't disappoint your audience. Not at all. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Carlos Andrade. Um, um, I'm Brazilian, um, born and raised in Brazil, uh, lawyer by training, um, went through law school, did a little bit of uh, work in the law uh, profession, but uh, didn't find that uh, particularly, um, let's put it this way, uh, I didn't think that the field I was going into was, uh, uh, was uh, constructive uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, I was in litigation. So it's essentially, it's a fight, right? So you don't, you're not really building anything. You're trying to, to ascertain guilt and that kind of thing. I said, no, that, absolutely, that's, that's not for me. Um, and I uh, always uh, had a keen interest on, um, you know, business and administration in general. So right about um, one year after I finished law school, I, um, I joined a telecom company. Um, through, you know, it was a, a procurement uh, department that needed uh, support with contracts. So that's why I, I brought in my, uh, uh, my background in law and uh, really enjoyed the experience. Um, also did a specialization in finance, which I love. It's actually my hobby and my side gig, uh, you know, <laughs> the stock market and that kind of thing. But finance in general is, is fascinating to me. Um, spent five years in that um, telecom company in a very interesting time was the uh, widespread adoption of uh, cell phones, uh, even before the smartphones, the transition for GS GSM technology. So it was very exciting, fond memories of that time. Um, after that, I spent uh, um, almost four years in a passenger vehicle manufacturer um, in Brazil, one of the top five in the world, um, extremely interesting um, experience. Uh, actually, the plant I used to work for uh, was manufacturing 3,000 vehicles per day in four, wow. uh, four different platforms. Each platform, four variants. Each variant, many options that they, uh, you can possibly imagine. So 3,000 vehicles running um, after the, the production line uh, every single day. And that, that for me was the best school um, in uh, one of the best schools that I had, certainly in um, cost management procurement, um, but also accountability and, uh, and uh, leadership in general. So very good time I spent in that company. Um, after four years, I actually moved to Canada where I live today in Montreal. Uh, I joined um, an air, um, airspace company, um, one of the top three in the world, um, where I spent actually most of my career, 14 years, um, in many capacities, um, business aviation or private aviation, as some people call it, uh, commercial aviation um, in many capacities. Um, and I have also learned a lot about uh, management. I, I learned about what works and what does not work. Um, aviation companies, uh, I, I think, are known for being very exposed to uh, economical cycles. Uh, but there is also uh, a lot to be learned in terms of uh, management and, and, um, and um, uh, performance and um, engagement, leadership. I think we're going to touch those points a, a little bit later. Um, and um, after so many years, in that, uh, in that capacity. In parallel, I, I kept going with my, uh, my studies. I finished um, a master degree in administration. Um, my uh, thesis was focused on uh, trust 
and the economic impacts of trust in relationships in between organizations. Um, and uh, following that master degree, I actually took another one, which was uh, um, a bilingual program here in Montreal, um, uh, McGill University and I should say, so it's an English and French um, program, uh, executive uh, MBA that I uh, just finished. And during this program, I actually uh, found an acute um, uh, sense of um, probably responsibility and, and uh, the need to seek purpose. And based on that, I actually started looking you know, for other opportunities um, from the professional sense that could satisfy that need. And uh, right about one year ago, I actually left a big corporation, 60,000 um, employees across the globe to join a, a startup uh, that is, uh, was, it's local uh, for now, it's local, uh, but we are developing um, and manufacturing an electric bus for public transportation. Um, there'll be 100% zero emission um, and, uh, and it's locally sourced, if you will, locally designed and with the French culture of uh, Quebec, where we are, we are based. Um, and that's been a very interesting journey for me, mm. very satisfying. Um, I actually found this, uh, this purpose that was missing for so long. And I think my mission here right now that I, is to um, help a small company to develop in the best way possible applying a little bit of the experiences on the past and if, if, uh, maybe trying to avoid some of the, um, uh, you know, the, the problems and the inefficiencies that I've seen across uh, uh, so many companies. Wow, um, Carlos, that sounds really uh, <laughs> amazing. Uh, one of the uh, people that I work with in the past told me, um, make sure you get really good work experience, but not the same experience every year. <laughs> and it seems to me that you've really lived that mantra of um, really going out there and, and getting a, a, a deep base on across multiple domains, industries, etc. So not living the same experience every year for 20 odd years. Um, well done. <laughs> that, yeah, that... I, I guess you could say that. I would even add something that I left out. I spent two years also in healthcare. <laughs> oh, okay. During the recovery of... Um, <laughs> of a hospital. So, yeah. So I just tried to shorten a little bit, but um, in all those places, one thing that uh, was always a constant for me was to understand the role of leadership mm. and what works and what does not work, what's transferable, because in the end you're working with people. So, mm. you know, regardless of the industry you are, there's always the human factor. Um, and I often feel that is there most of the time that uh, um, the leadership teams fail to recognize the potentials and the, the risks associated with poor management. And, uh, and that's what I observed across those industries. Well, we definitely would want to explore that a bit. Um, and the exploration is, is not going to be um, like you experienced uh, in your early years as a lawyer. We're not going to be very uh, aggressive. Uh, or attacking, it's more about uh, a meander. So yeah. um, during all of those experiences, you've, you've probably been exposed quite a lot to different settings, different behaviors, different experiences um, with uh, oversight and governance. Um, and there's obviously the tradition, traditional govern, uh, uh, corporate view of it, etc. But it, I would be keen to explore a little bit about how that looked in an innovation setting. You, you spoke about the, the new bus. You, you spent some time probably at um, innovation in the, the motor company as well as the yeah. aviation uh, organization that you, that you mentioned. But how does that look? How does oversight and governance look in an innovation setting? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting topic. And um, of course I do have some experience on that, but I guess overall it depends on the culture of uh, the leadership, uh, the, the leadership team 
uh, on each company, of course, you would expect that um, if you're in a, um, in a field that requires a whole lot of um, innovation, a fast pace, a, 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 you know, developing industry, um, you would expect that um, you would have an environment that is um, fostering creativity, uh, the mm -hmm. free flow of ideas, uh, communication, uh, and, uh, and et cetera. But you need to understand that um, in those contexts, if you do have a company that is still very young and is maturing and is going through growth periods, there's a whole lot of adjustments that need to happen when you move from a project, a startup, let's say, which what we're doing right now, we're going into industrialization in a capital intensive industry. So I often feel, and I've seen that in other um, organizations that the leadership team ends up kind of um, struggling a little, a little bit with uh, oversight because they don't know how much to control, how much to let a little bit um, lose. They don't know how much to take the, um, uh, the wheels because it's a very young company and you know everybody's learning and we need to be decisive, right? Because decisions need to be uh, timely. But at the same time, at what point you can trust a little bit more on your teams to make mistakes um, and learn from it. So I wouldn't say that I, I could classify um, how is oversight in an um, innovation setting in a generalized way, but I can identify the fact that everybody talks about innovation and talk about creativity and all this, those buzzwords that we all know very well. But what I came to experience is that, yes, innovation in a very um, dynamic environment creates confusion, creates this growth, you know, the, those pains of, 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 of um, you know, growth pains, I would say, and, and adjustments that are necessary for every company going through this. But I think that what separates the companies that will be successful and the companies that might not be as successful is how fast they can adapt to the new reality and find that that works for them, right? Yeah. And that's yep. why we call our research adaptive oversight. So um, it, exactly and it it's not just, I don't think it's, it's just the uh, new startups or, or uh, um, companies in that early phase of, of their life, but if you, you need adaptation in other uh, more traditional settings as well. Um, because if you don't adapt, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, the work that, um, that's been done by uh, the guy, uh, the father of, uh, oh, now the name, for, I've, I forgot. Aitiono, you mean? No. Um, Darwin. Darwin, Darwin has said that is the most Darwin. adapter that survives. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. and right. it, it, it's, it is about that. Or you um, wanted to ask a question there? Yeah. Yeah. Um... A, a word that Carlos used um, kind of sparked some thinking for me. Uh, you were talking about mistakes uh, and how safe is it to, to make mistakes. And that reminded me uh, of, a, of a different uh, leader of a, uh, of a young organization here in New Zealand. And he was talking about how he's had to teach himself to rethink the use of words and he has banned, uh, as a founder in this uh, young organization, he has banned the use of the word problem. So in other words, when people come to him and say, hey, boss, I have a problem, uh, he would say, no, 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 no. You don't have a problem. You have a challenge. Right? So don't talk to me about problems. Talk to me about challenges. Because problem has this feeling of, oh, I have a problem, and uh, it's some kind of a failure. And the thing is, failure doesn't exist he says, because you only fail if you don't learn. Otherwise, you have a challenge, you try something, and you learn. And whether that was successful in the sense that you've actually achieved what you were hoping in terms of overcoming the challenge directly, or you've learned a way in which, damn it, it doesn't quite work yet, you still gained something. So you didn't fail as such. 
right? So in other words, it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> the mistake is not learning <laughs> from the experiment or continuing on with something ineffective. So um, I thought to ask you, uh, what's your view on, on rapid learning? Uh, and how do you tackle this, uh, this tendency to, to deal with, with problems and kind of get depressed about them? Well, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, first of all, when you approach things with a growth mindset, right? So um, Jorge and I already shared uh, our personal experiences. I, uh, I practice uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, Jorge uh, practice Aikido. Um, and um, we shared some of the uh, principles that we learned from martial arts in general and sports. And uh, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, our master from the Gracie family uh, he's got a sentence that I, I think it's brilliant. He says, you never lose on jujitsu. You either win or you learn. And that's brilliant. And I, I coach kids as well, right? And sometimes I see them trying a technique and it doesn't work. And, you know, the, the training partner is doing something that is not expected or is stronger or more skilled or whatever that is. And the kids get very frustrated and they give up right? And they give up, they stop fighting, they stop trying, they stop thinking. And that's the end of it. That's, that's the end of the combat. That's the end of learning. That's the end of the experience. So that, that learning mindset, Horia, I think it's the key, right? So the, the minute you start framing things in terms of, no, this is not a problem. This is not a roadblock. This is a challenge. It already, it's already implicit that there is a way to crack this. There is a way to crack the code, and it's only a problem if you give up, right? If you keep, if you stop fighting, right? And um, I think it's a role of leadership to establish exactly this kind of mindset and culture in organizations. And when I say it's the role of leadership, it's not only, but I would say, you know, we lead by example, right? So it's a well-known um, uh, expression. It's a well-spoken, it's almost like a, a, you know, a catchphrase, but it's not very, um, very practiced. In, in my experience, you don't, you don't really see that in action. And what that means in the context of making mistakes and learning is, well, you can't expect that the organization will simply learn by osmosis or will mm -hmm. learn what they call on the job learning. You need to have a targeted, um, you know, initiative or uh, a targeted energy, a targeted objective to make sure that knowledge is communicated, it's shared, and that those experiences are used as a learning opportunity. Like, you know, when I teach kids, when I coach kids, I say, okay, so, okay, you're frustrated, you gave up, right? But hold, hold on a minute. Call, call your training partner. Come back here. Come back here what was the position you guys were and it was not working for you let's see let's let's look into the details what what was not work oh i see the problem if you do just this if you hold it this way look check if it's going to work but you need to sh you need to go you need to go do the root cause analysis right mm. you need to understand it and you need to show it you can't just say oh try harder next time <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen, right? And, and it, it's funny because um, Hori has got a military background. I never been to the military, but I've studied a lot military organizations just as inspiration for strategy and, and organizations. And, you know, military had to operate in an efficient way because it's a, literally a life and death um, question, right? And sometimes we forget some very fundamental questions. For example, what is the first thing that in the military people do when you have a new recruit? What, what is the process before the recruit will actually you know, take a rifle and be parachuted somewhere else? You need to go to training, mm. right? You need to go to physical adaptation. You need to understand the skills. You need to get the instruction. There's no on the job training on the battlefield. You're not going to see someone teaching how to reload a rifle 
for the first time, when you have bullets flying over your head, you're dead. <laughs> but that's what happened on every company. <laughs> Why is that so? Mm. Why is that so? You hire someone, right? That came from a school. Okay, you did your due diligence. You did the good interviews. But guess what? It, what you're hiring is a potential, right? It's someone mm. with a good hardware and probably some fundamental firmware, if you will, that will get into your company and learn everything they need to be performing at the level that you expect. <laughs> You're not going to take the time to teach, to learn, to uh, talk about the culture, to talk about the why, why you're doing things. So fast learning, Horia, um, it's as fast as you put the energy on it. It's not as it's not a fast on the basis of, like I said, right, on the job. Okay, I'm going to expose you to this and you'll learn, you'll see. I've been through this process way too many times. And I can, I can certainly certify that if I, had, if I had had someone, and I had a few, with the patience to walk me through the why and the reasons why my learning curve was exponentially accelerated, exponentially. But I often find people in organizations that have no freaking idea why they're doing things and, the, and for what is the purpose. Nobody told them. Yeah, yeah. That's a, well, that's a really great explanation, Carlos. And um, so a few things, you said that the onus is really on leadership to make sure that that environment exists, that learning happens, etc., <clears throat> and that the right type of learning happens at the right time. You've implied um, all of those types of things. Now, I'm going to ask you a little bit of a, 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 a direct question here is the, the, the onus falls on leadership uh, and traditionally some sometimes management and you said some organizations struggle with that what is it that you think oversight or oversight uh, capabilities in organizations need to do in order to ensure that that actually happens that it creates that environment of learning well i i think it starts with what is the purpose of management mm. what is the purpose of leadership what is the value add of leadership we don't do anything. We don't produce anything. Mm. We are essentially dead weight. We are, we are a cost for most organizations. I'm the first one to admit that. Yes. Okay. Hold I on, hold on, I'm hold on. I'm, I'm not accepting that just yet. So okay. uh, let, let's let take it as a hypothesis for now, but I'll okay. challenge it in a moment. So okay. <laughs> just I'll, to be I'll clear. Get to that. <laughs> okay, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Okay. But as a manager, right? I'm not an engineer, right? I, I'm not an accountant, okay? I'm a lawyer, but I don't, you know, I'm not litigating or writing my contracts. I, I'm, not, I'm not bolting things on our vehicle. What exactly, what exactly is my value add? Let's start with that. What's my role in life? What's my heads on that? Mm. Well, I'm here and usually management you know, makes the big bucks because, because there is a sense that you need leadership, you need coordination, and you need decision-making in a solid and concise and um, directed way. And you need someone that can um, take care of that resource allocation and make the difficult decisions and think about planning and decide the order of priority amongst other things. Okay, that's the, that's the um, classical role of leadership, but hold on a minute. How about the enabling part? Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about learning, for example, right? For me, I see the role of leadership and I'll get to oversight. It's slightly different. So for example, 
we want we have we are we are developing certifying and we're going to be building an electric bus great we have a great mission ahead of us right we're going to do great things for our community for the environment and for the development of a, um, a sustainable economy that's great okay in order for us to do that there's a strategic plan there's the product there's all that and then hold on a minute what's the structure what's the architecture structure that i need to execute this plan so okay so here i start adding value okay so based on my experience on my my knowledge here's the type of the organization that i want to build okay so now let's go let's go on and let's find the good fit the talents that i need the expertises that i need the mindsets that i need to fill those positions and those building blocks now i have a mission i have an architecture or an organizational architecture and i have people with good potential but they're not still they're not productive yet right they need to be they need to be engaged and they need to be enabled they need to be engaged on the mission of the company on our strategic plan okay they applied for a job that means that they demonstrated an interest but okay now that you're here let's talk a little bit more about the details why we're doing this what's our purpose right so what are our objectives they need to be engaged mm -hmm. and they also need to be enabled right what are the good tools for you for them to do their job what is what's expected from them how they're going to be measured right what do the what do they need what kind of instruction they need i think that this is all the role of good leadership but it's not what i see when i see when i say we don't produce anything horia and i say that provocatively is because if you look at the you know most companies balance sheets you're going to see most of the high paying jobs right they are up 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 to the ladder of the organization but in the end especially in the very large organizations those people they essentially um they are trying to control and squeeze productivity if you will from people below them yeah. always unfortunately through endless powerpoint sessions right that's that's what happens right <laughs> and without noticing that every layer that you add what essentially what you're doing is making communication more distant mm. and more difficult and of course if you're in a very large organization where pressure is the rule and people up there they are just you know saying you know quarterly results quarterly results quarterly results everybody that will prepare a powerpoint for the level above will tend to try just to highlight a little bit of the positive and say that the negative is not that negative we already have a plan to take care of that mm. you multiply that by 15 levels how i've experienced in my own life then so what what may happen is that you may have a fire on the production floor and the ceo will hear that the results on the production floor are so great that the team is actually throwing a barbecue just to celebrate that's the reason for the smoke i'm i'm exaggerating but i've i've lived through almost unbelievable experiences such as this one so yeah. you take those 15 levels of management what is the value that they are adding so when you say oversight right what what is it that they are helping the people that actually produce the people on the floor because if they are only demanding reports on the results that's not oversight that's no. reporting so it's enablement I'm sorry, what did you say? So it's enablement. Yeah, so, so for me, and I've learned that with the good leaders I have, 
um, oversight tends to be something actually very simple is a communication of our purpose, our long-term mm -hmm. strategy, right? Setting very clear goals for the short term and making sure that you have frequent enough touch points to discuss. First question, if things are on track and if they are, tap on the back, perfect, keep on, you're doing a great job. If things are not on track, okay, what's your assessment of why things are not on track? And what do you need to get things back on track? Maybe you need more enablement. Mm. Maybe you need more direction. Maybe you need help to escalate something. That's when leadership comes in, right? That's, that's how I see oversight mm. is actually a partnership. Is, is like, tell me if you're able to mm -hmm. deliver what you propose to deliver. It, based on the conversation we had ahead, right? We discussed the plan, we set the objectives, and then you said, okay, I'm going with that. Do you have what you need? Yes, good, good, good. Okay, go, go for it. For two weeks from now, let's have a touch point to see how things are progressing. And, and by the way, if you have an urgency before that, Give me a call. Right. <clears throat> Give me a call. But that's not what happens. In most companies, people dread those sessions, right? Because they know that the session with the boss is coming and they and, know things are not all right. And the boss usually freaks out. Yeah. <laughs> and the boss will freak out and the boss will tell them, clean this mess, get your act together. I don't want to see this again next week mm. and next week there'll be a meeting just you and me and you will report the results of your cleaning house yeah. what and, are the chances um, it's going to be a good one. <laughs> the key word there in in that uh, quote um carlos is clean up your mess yeah yeah it, it's the wrong particle your it's not your mm. mess it's our mess <laughs> and it's not you have to clean up uh, the mess that you made and hold on a second if i'm the leader it's my responsibility and it's not your mess it's my mess because it's on my watch that this happened <laughs> right so that's uh what um i thought about challenging in terms of uh our, our leaders dead weight um because they don't produce or don't, don't seem to produce anything well actually uh, my suggestion or challenge is um, that, again, another word I absolutely love, challenge, it has, a, again, an interesting dual meaning. So the challenge that I propose here is leaders actually um, are most productive because they produce awesome people. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Real leaders. Real exactly. Leaders. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, I so when you're 100%. leading well, your main product is not the uh, end service or product that your company makes, but the people that could make anything. You just happen to be in the making electric buses business. But if tomorrow the sort of world changes and we have a new technology of this and that, you could repurpose clever ingenious people uh, that trust one another to do whatever else that they might set their um, energy to do. I couldn't agree more. And actually it goes back to the comment that Alda made at the beginning when I was talking about my several experiences in different fields. And I said, amongst all those things, the common denominator is people in mm. the way you manage people. So the the way leadership and governance is set up today i can tell you Horia, that the value add compared to how much it costs to mm -hmm. companies i don't think it's possible i think the most <laughs> the vast majority of cases is negative right yeah. and i even um, <laughs> there is a, an economic theory that transaction cost i think it was uh, proposed by uh, ronald course sorry for my nerdy um, Thing here, but it was part of my uh, thesis uh, for my master's degree. So this guy was in 1930s. He proposed that successful businesses 
they grow up to the limit of the transaction cost. What does that mean? Well, the transaction cost is every cost that is not associated with the final product, right? So if you have, you know, if you have a, like a device and you have a screw or you have a, a component, it goes on the part, okay, that's, that's direct cost, right? Everything else that you spend to manage the building of that, you can call that transaction cost. So if you have a successful business, it means that you produce something for five, you sell it for 10, you have a five margin, great. But if your transaction cost starts growing to the point that this margin gets just you know, squeezed by overhead, you get to a point where you have the monster companies we all heard about back in, in the 90s, the GEs of the day and, uh, you know, and, and others. And they have incredibly successful businesses, but they also have incredibly complicated governance and management teams and transaction costs that are off the scale. Yeah. So that kills companies, right? So when I say, Horia, that in, in many companies, the, the burden of management is poorly deployed is exactly because of those of these compound effects of poor management being compensated by poor management. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is oftentimes I see companies when they are doing poorly, what do they do? They add another layer of government mm -hmm. or they tighten the controls or they call an auditor or they spend money with, you know, a very expensive consultancy firm. But hold on, they start micromanaging. Mm -hmm. okay, that's, that's the wrong answer. <clears throat> that's the wrong answer in most cases. Of course, there's a, there is a, you know, a place for all those tools and, and, and remedies, but you know, oversight for me um, in most companies, in most cases, needs to be streamlined big time, but starts mm -hmm. with a, a very clear reflection of the role of leadership. What is the role of leadership? Is it yeah. squeezing people to clean their messes or is <laughs> producing good people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Horia said. Yeah. So. Here's, here's a phenomenon I'm, I'm noticing is that um, what you just explained is typically something that a new, a new um, managing director or CEO of a company would come in and try and do when they try and clean house. Especially if the company's in trouble and they bring somebody in from external. Um, but that those efforts stop. At some stage, the the inertia wins over everything. And then the CEO starts to prepare his resignation letter because, you know, that the writing's on the wall. Um, so that, that's a pattern that I'm noticing. And that means that um, the, the, the structure itself or the, 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 the way the organization is, is, is structured to deliver on that value is not the right structure. And now, obviously, when you touch on the word structure, you immediately see people, oh, job descriptions, oh, my job's on the line, et cetera. So there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of, uh, it's a big tightrope that, that <laughs> you gotta, you got to really be brave to come in and, and, and walk that tightrope tight in, in that context. Now, for some of those, it works quite well. Uh, there are success stories of that um, turnaround. But there's, there's another sector that we tend to think that happens, but it's just more of the same. And I noticed this in, in government, government departments, is that, oh, we're in trouble, we're so inefficient, we'll just get in another bureaucrat to come and turn the ship around for us, and then it's just more of the same. Hmm. How do we solve that? 
you 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 talked about governance and oversight that needs to be uh, um, um, attentive to, to 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 that context and that needs to be you need you need to delayer some of the, the the stuff but that doesn't happen in 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 governance in government um, departments for instance and I know you work in the corporate world but are there any ideas out there? Yeah. Well, you know, there are problems that are complicated. There are problems that are complex, right? And, and unfortunately, there are some cycles of vicious cycles, cycles, right? That unfortunately reinforce uh, the habits that we are seeing here, right? So for example, you're saying people tend to talk about restructuring and job descriptions and all this great stuff. Why? Well, for one, because that's very visible, right? So every new executive that walks through the door to clean a mess, on, and I imagine in the government uh, sector, it will be the same, right? Their clock starts to tick day one. And, and especially if they are highly paid and they were um, hired with much funfare and expectations, People will want to see changes immediately. Otherwise, they're just, oh, oh, oh. Uh, you know, there's, mm. I don't think we got a good one, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not delivering on the promise, right? And unfortunately, those, you know, these people are also uh, exposed to this pressure of starting, of making visible changes or progress. And I think it's a natural um, human expectation, right? And it's, it's complex enough not to have one solution, but I think everything starts um, even before day one, which is clarifying what are exactly the expectations and what the executive, or in that case, the official, will actually propose to do before taking the job. And, you know, at what time? Mm. And I've, I've had this problem before myself. I mentioned briefly that I, uh, I spent two years in healthcare. Well, by chance, I was hired uh, from outside as someone with management experience to come in to a medium-sized hospital that was close to bankruptcy. And the mandate was to recover it. Mm. And I got this mandate directly from the owner and founder of that organization, an organization with 35 years of experience and excellence. And I had a very direct conversation before I took the job. And I said, do you want me to recover the organization? Okay, so I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to touch that part, right? the clinical part that would be someone. But on, from the management side, that means changing a whole lot of stuff that you built in the last 35 years and you believe to be the best way to do it. Are you prepared? And point blank, he said, yes. And we signed a contract with the objectives and all this great stuff and off we went. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, I realized something that I could only describe by what I imagine is the relationship between a personal trainer and somebody that wants to go through a personal transformation, right? So imagine someone who's never been sporty and, you know, it's a, what we call couch potato and Netflix and eating badly. And then you say, oh my God, I, you know, I'm uh, close to, you know, um, a heart attack. I need to, I need to change my life, right? Let's, let me hire the, you know, the, the most com competent, badass personal trainer that I can possibly find. And you know what? I'll, I'll tell him or her, I'll follow your program. I you know, trust in you. Here's a contract I'll, I'll sign and I need you because you know, I'm dying. Okay, perfect. Do you know what that means? Yes, I do know what that means. Okay, no problem. Monday morning, 6 a.m., bedside, Here's the personal trainer with the whistle. Get the freaking out of your bed. It's time to hit the road and start running. 
That's what you wanted? Yes, that's what I wanted. How long do you think that's going to take? <laughs> Until... Yeah. Until the person that wanted to go through a personal transformation hates the personal trainer to the core of their existence. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. Why is that? But you were dying. I'm trying to help you. I'm delivering yeah. exactly what yeah. you want. Well, it starts with what you really want. Mm. So that's, and unfortunately, when you're signing contracts, you're being hired, right? You unfortunately you don't have time or the opportunity to get deep into this self-reflection with the people that will actually hire you, mm. right? So what I learned from that experience is that unfortunately, you need to take everything with a grain of salt and you have to use uh, a big deal of change management on the personal level mm. You know, before you can start making, you know, ground shattering changes. And of course, there's, there's literature on change management, there's bringing people along and, you know, all sorts of, uh, of, um, of approaches that personally, I'm not, I'm not the best to, <laughs> to talk about that, because my style is more get the job done. Right? Let's, there's something wrong, let's fix it. Right, let's fix it and let's fix it good. And let's fix it right the first time. But that's not, that's not the vast majority of the human experience in most companies. And if we go back to what I said at the beginning, right? The human factor. Mm. Yes, the human factor. With all the qualities and short, shortcomings is there and needs to be taken in consideration, especially the owners, right? the entrepreneurs, the people that will make the calls and sometimes will make personal calls, not necessarily financially sound mm. calls, right? So, yeah. Yeah, somebody nice. said some, so Somebody said earlier this week uh, is that all decisions are emotional. And um, you, you just explained that. And I also now had flashbacks from my coaching career and it's exactly what you just explained is come change us. No, we don't want to change. <laughs> there is a, Horia and I, we already discussed, I think it's a book of Daniel Kahneman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thinking fast, fast and yeah. slow. That's the one, yeah. That's groundbreaking because mm. what he said, what he said in his genius is we tend to think of us like rational beings, right? You take data, you take information, right? you make a sound calculation of pros and cons, and then you make decisions. Mm. That's not how we operate. Humans operate on the basis of, I want to do X, and now I'm using my rational uh, logic to find a reason that justifies that. Mm. And in a, in a business setting where most managers and leaders are measured by optimizing resources and results this dynamic is still there this dynamic is still there we are all people yeah there's an interesting um dynamic playing out at the moment in new zealand healthcare um they're hemorrhaging people um left right and center we're losing nurses and doctors to other countries we can't um recruit um, doctors and nurses into our industry fast enough and they just had a change of leadership and one of the first things that um, was said is that uh, and now this is controversial is that all of these management consultants or all of, or all of these consultants are going to have to go and it's like really are you are you thinking through what you've just decreed because that's half your capacity that's already limited. So what you just explained um, is, <laughs> is, is playing out real time in New yeah. Zealand at the moment. Right. I'll probably well, get, get uh, I'll probably get my egg. My house would probably get egged for saying that. But <laughs> anyway, the, the thing is, uh, there's a beautiful TED talk um, about what's happening in the mind of a procrastinator. 
Um, so think about it this way. Um, we have, uh, we, we, we'd, we'd like to think we have a rational decision maker in our mind, yeah? But what we have instead is uh, a pleasure-seeking monkey that looks for, <laughs> for, for things that are fun and simple, right? Because yeah. if I have a deadline, I don't really want to do the hard work of kind of doing things and, and getting to the result of the deadline. I want to enjoy this and look at that and, mm. uh, you know, you look for the fun and the simple. But what happens then if you do have a deadline is then the panic monster comes in and the panic monster scares the pleasure seeking monkey away <laughs> so that the rational decision maker can 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 say okay the panic monster is here let me let me do the work right so unfortunately what we have it seems in uh, society at large and in many organizations is uh, we are gripped by the uh, inertia of being in um, sort of in the hands of the pleasure-seeking monkey that wants things to be simple. Uh, don't get me to change. Uh, don't get me to think. You, you, uh, let, let me just do what's easy. I mean, uh, that person, as you were saying, that that uh, coach, that um, consultant. Ah, they're challenging my thinking. They're they're annoying me. They're they're they're. Uh, but I told them to do this, and they say. Are you sure that's a clever thing? Look, uh, it has this and this and this and impact. Oh, my ego is threatened. Therefore, let's get get rid of them. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So, what, yeah, what do we do? See what you said. Yeah, that, that that dealing with the you know um, the pleasure seeking monkey that all of us have might be one of the roles and or the values had by oversight. That's right. Because if you're capable of defining a plan and you're capable of breaking down this plan, long-term plan, into workable chunks that are, are achievable, timely bound, the smart objectives, right? And you can actually keep the drum beat of progression through a framework or oversight. Well, without noticing, you are dealing with the procrastination mm. um, tendency that we all have, right? <clears throat> leadership and workers, right? Because as members of the leadership team, you need to be prepared for the, you know, keeping the drumbeat and making mm. corrections when those are due. The, the people that are responsible for producing the results, yeah, well, they need to, they need to make sure that they are, you know, online. Right, they are, they are according to the plan. If they are not, what do they need? And mm. and and that goes back a little bit to <clears throat> some um, some thoughts from uh, Joko, which is a well-known um, um, you know former military and black belt uh, jujitsu and now uh, speaker, and he talks about accountability, mm -hmm. radical accountability. If I'm not mistaken, the way he extreme ownership, it. yeah extreme ownership, right? So it's accountability. It's, um, assigning collaborative accountability, that's for me, it's a role of leadership and oversight. But it's it's what Horia said, it's not your mess, it's our mess. Yeah. And we <laughs> are accountable for that. Yeah, yeah. And also what you're saying brings to mind the idea that we shouldn't necessarily see leadership and the people doing the work as being kind of separate communities um, it's more everybody as a leader because you want to develop the strength and the insight and the capability and you want to either pull or push the authority to where the best information is because if i'm making a decision uh in a remote location and i'm not noticing exactly what's happening um uh, where the issue is is occurring, then I may make completely silly decisions. Mm. Yeah. I want to uh, just um, I, I want to close off uh, the, this part of the, the discussion um, just by saying that the research that we've done over the last two years in, in adaptive oversight and your mention of Kahneman and the human factor, we noticed that quite a lot of the things that um, where oversight fails or where oversight is over applied, let's call it that, um, has got to do with 
the human factor. It's got to do with, 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 with humans and their behaviors. So that's, a, again, a, an insight that, uh, that I just got. I yeah, want to move on. To, just to add to that, uh, yeah. Aldo, business in general, it's not that difficult. Accounting, people are scared about accounting, finance, not that difficult, right? We have tools for everything. We have software mm. for everything. We have good practices. We have entire EMBA or MBA programs available on YouTube. That's not the difficult part. The difficult part, which most companies fail miserably, is exactly managing the human factor. It's exactly the good, um, the good deployment of the mm. just, just the, the good amount of oversight and governance mm. that will not overload people with what I called non-productive work, right? But we will also not let the pleasure-seeking monkey take over the organization mm. and say, well, I'll do that tomorrow. Our customers wait, because that's not going to work. Now, the most important thing that comes to mind for me here is uh, I want to be able to respect my leaders. Uh, I don't want to point at them and say, ha ha, you're Dilbert's pointy haired boss kind of thing. Yeah, I'm much more interested in getting people stronger, getting them better. And in other words, I don't want to blame leaders and say, um, current leaders of today, you suck. Uh, look at the mess that the uh, society is in. Look at the mess the organizations are in. Yeah, because uh, that doesn't help anybody. You just alienate um, uh, people, and um, you're not going to get go anywhere. You're not part of making things better. You're only making things worse because you're going to fracture egos. You're going to piss people off. You're not really building relationships with them uh, to, to get that. things better. Yeah. So yeah, sure. If you just want to um, express your frustration, sure, go ahead. But that's not the point. The point is, how do we get better together? How do we um, go from wherever it is that we are? We are where we are. Yeah. And it's not so much that we're all malicious, because that's the thing. When we find ourselves in the situation that we find in, we are prisoners of our existing systems. We are prisoners of our the expectations of the people around us, and the um, you know the the Wall Street says you got to make these numbers in this quarter. So therefore, God, what do I do? I have to, uh, and I hire this consultant, and they go, I don't know, let's fire these people or let's outsource to I don't know China. Yeah, rush, rush, because you've got to make the numbers. And you're not really, really thinking strategically. You're, you're thinking with your kind of, you know, the pleasure-seeking monkey, let me get the bonus now, as opposed to, hold on a second, strategically, what's good for the community, the nation, the, the world, yeah? So <laughs> I'm much more interested in how do we make a thriving world? How do we improve and inspire our leaders to get better? rather than just um, react out of um, ego or uh, resentment or um, just... Yeah, and, um, and if, I can, if I may, you touched the topic that is um, very dear to my heart. I mean, it's one of the theories that I, you know, after being so long in, in uh, publicly traded companies and also private companies, and also discussed... Um, with some CEOs that been through a transition from a, a private owned company to a public company, I have a very hard time believing that um, public, publicly traded companies in the vast majority are actually able to establish this um, um, respectful uh, way of building uh, governance and leadership because of this um, nefarious dynamic of quarterly results. Yeah, short term as well. Yes, and it's, it's the way the system is con conceived, right? <clears throat> For example, uh, uh, and I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, finance is, is my great hobby and I trade in stocks on you know, my free time and all this great stuff. I don't get into the um, annual reports of the companies to see if they have good healthcare 
for their um, employees or if they have an, a policy of a parental leave or as an investor, the only thing that matters to me is return on my investment. And if this company is not delivering that to me, I'll leave it and I'll buy another stock. Mm. So if that gets translated into stock pricing, and if, if this is a function of the quarterly results and the analysts' opinions and all this great stuff, how can you expect the leadership team in those companies to actually focus on long-term sustainable growth. Yeah, I find it hard, and I haven't seen it yet. In the publicly traded companies mm. that I've been through, I could not see it. And it's always, you know, your employee, you look at your boss, and maybe you have a good relationship, you say, well, you know, you're asking me to do this, but it doesn't make any sense. And oftentimes, you will see, yeah, I agree with you, but that's, that's what the office asked us to do. Yeah. So then when you move up the ladder, I had this conversation with my bosses and they said, yeah. well, yeah, I yeah, agree with yeah, you. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't make any sense, but it's endless. And the, the thing shareholders, is, the yeah. shareholders, this, the shareholders that, yeah. The key word there is growth, right? Because ultimately um, nothing grows forever. Because if you do in nature, that's called a cancer, right? If you have uncontrolled growth. <laughs> So you don't want a cancerous growth. You want a healthy growth. And that sometimes requires um, adaptation. So for instance, you, you look at um, birth rates and you see that they've declined quite precipitously. In, and it's, it's a pattern that you can see wherever. Uh, as soon as the economic uh, outlook becomes a little bit better, the uh, birth rate decreases significantly. So therefore, you can't expect the same kind of path of unlimited uh, growth. There will have to be uh, some form of natural um, constraint and restraint, um, if you will. And what you're most interested really is in how do you thrive in uh, a context of diminished um, resource? Because again, re reacting with panic, it only makes things worse. I mean, um, the lean community and queuing theory tells us very clearly that don't overreact, right? Take it slow, mm. understand, you know, um, common cause and special cause variation, if you really want to get technical. Um, but um, you, you have a fabulous point about activist investors, um, uh, Carlos, because uh, if you don't uh, want to sort of uh, follow the, the pressure of the of the market and you say no nope, uh, we're uh, actively looking into the into the future better you may end up with silly activist investors that come in and kind of take the leadership uh, out from under you and what are they going to do they potentially can essentially strip your uh, corporation for assets right uh, the old uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, that have been perpetrated by by many organizations have been nothing but um, sort of ridiculous uh, sort of um, rent-seeking um, activities. Yeah. But you see the level of the paradox, right? Mm. While in one side of my life, I'm very conscious about what poor leadership might do to a company. Yeah. And as someone who's been you know, on the two sides of this equation, as an employee that was reporting to a very long chain of command and in a often, you know, functional and dysfunctional uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and I came to study that, right, through many opportunities. The same guy will, you know, finish a discussion on that topic and open, you know, a, a website to check on today's um, price of stocks I invest on. Mm. And that's all that I'm going to look at. Right? I'm not going to look at what's going on in the company if their employees are happy. So it's a, it's a, it's a perverse and incentive scheme that does not allow, in my opinion, um, for publicly traded companies to really pay attention on, you know, good, sustainable uh, leadership. And that's one of the reasons why I transitioned to a privately owned company. Yeah. It was yeah, well, exactly. One to, can to, only to hope. have the opportunity to, to build something the right way. Mm. 
That's fabulous. Uh, one can only hope that um, enough um, reinvigoration of the, of the public psyche makes it so that it becomes important to pay more attention. I mean, you hear people talk about um, ESG, uh, basically environmental, social and governance um, concerns. Um, you've seen uh, recently uh, a reinvention of the definition of the purpose of a corporation by the um, US Chamber of Commerce um, as well. So there are some um, good uh, signs that there could be uh, new and different and better things. You see the work of the guys from the corporate rebels. You see Gary Hamill's new human movement uh, about humanocracy. So um, it's not at all a, a picture of, of complete doom and gloom, um, if you mm. will. In, in some respects, it's the best time to be alive, um, as uh, Steven Pinker might, uh, might argue. But uh, equally so, we have tremendous challenges as well, as we were saying. Yeah, I think one of the missing things is a universal acceptance that we need to define value in a different way. Absolutely. Um, it's not just, um, you know, the, the, the sound that gold makes in your, in your pocket. We have to look at defining value and had, have it universally accepted in a different way. And I just think trying to help, just from my experience, trying to help organizations to rethink what value means. And it's not just return on investment, but there's other aspects to value um, just getting them to think in that way, it's scary. Um, it's, when it's people difficult. look at you as if you've got three heads. So <laughs> it's difficult because the incentives, yeah. right? And if we if we can go into uh, you know behavior economics, it's all about incentives, right? Mm. And unfortunately, the easiest, the easier um, incentives are economical, right? Mm. So the, you have a whole system that is built upon delivering results on investments on returns it's a monetary measure mm. for everything yeah but i think horia is right um, even on some um investment uh, websites uh, already publishing some esg scores and paying more and more atten attention to other factors that helps and i think that emboldens the leadership that really want to do the right things to maybe able to present results, not only in the terms of short-term um, uh, you know, um, profits or whatever it might be, but also in the context of long-term sustainable growth. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the thing to, to be wary of there is greenwashing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, where you, you, you kind of pay lip service uh, <clears throat> to, <laughs> to the situation and, and uh, kind of keep uh, business as usual. Um, but that's yeah. a, a temptation that uh, it's been long with the humans. Um, you may remember the conversations around Potemkin villages and, <laughs> and so on. So it's not a new <laughs> invention. Mm. Uh, um, this is another controversial uh, topic and uh, that I'd like to cover with us. Um, and it is controversial because there are many of these types of organizations out there. And you, uh, Carlos, you've worked with quite a lot of them probably throughout your career. Um, they fly in, they give you something, they tell you what your problem is, they tell you what your solution is, and then they fly out and then whatever they leave doesn't always work. But you do get others of those things, and I'll, I'll label it shortly. <laughs> you, you do get other types of those organizations that do come in and actually genuinely help. They, they are actually able and capable of making a difference. Now, my question here is, is and, and the, the type of organization I'm talking about are consultancies. Mm -hmm. um, and my question here is, is what kind of, um, how do you think they, what role they can play in improving the work of organizations? Um, because there are some good that, that that's being done. No, I, I definitely agree. Um, I think the easiest answer is when you have people that are able to come from a different reality, that is not, um, to use a strong word, contaminated by the bad habits of mm. a certain organization that can see things differently, especially when it's already proven elsewhere, right? And 
uh, start to provoke this kind of reflection that there might be a better way of doing things, I think that's very positive. I think that's the kind of value, amongst other things, that consultancy companies uh, may bring um, and, and facilitate. Um, expert technical expertise, I would say, is, is another category, right? So sometimes you simply do not have the knowledge, you don't have the know-how. You need you know, support, you need help, but always in this growth mindset, right? When you're yeah. looking at consultancies as a way to accelerate um, your improvement, and when I say your organizational improvement, I think that's all well and good. I think that's that's very positive. That's that's the same thing as you know hiring um, I don't know a language uh, coach to teach you um, a different language that expedite your your learning or to go back to sports. Right, my uh, jujitsu coach. I cannot learn it without this knowledge that I do not possess. I need mm. to go seek that from somewhere else. But oftentimes to go back to what you really want, the big discussion, what you really want. Oftentimes I see um, consultancy firms parachuting into situations that are already difficult enough just to satisfy anxieties coming from higher above, mm. right? So as you know, there's, there's this saying in the market that nobody will ever be fired by hiring the big four consultancy firms. <laughs> that is true. Um, they might not be fired, but I'm not sure they're going to solve the problems. <laughs> right? Because if all they want is job security, you say, well, you know what? I, I hired this very expensive, um, you know, polished, full of accolades uh, consultancy firm. I did everything I did. If they could not fix it, bad luck, right? Nobody could. If mm. that's the purpose, that's a bad start, but unfortunately mm. goes back to those incentives that we have, right? If you're in a big corporation and they're used to doing that kind of thing, is that's the norm. That's unfortunately, believing or not, that the solution may lie on the big four consultancies, they will do it because if they do otherwise, and the problem is not fixed, there will always be someone to say, you should have called the big force. Mm -hmm. So again, what's, what's the expectation, right? Do you want someone to come in and start job cutting or just squeezing? Okay, any consultancy will do. You want to expedite growth from within, from a learning perspective, from a growth mindset. Oh, okay. So now we're talking about value add. Mm. We're good. But that does not happen in three weeks. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. That does not happen with a consultancy that will leave and, and just deliver, you know, a 50 page long PowerPoint with amazing um, charts that have been created even elsewhere or outsourced as one does. Um, and there are, <laughs> I've, I've seen, I know, um, I know. and, and, and more often than not, the leaders that actually hired the consultancies are too embarrassed to acknowledge that they can't even understand what those charts say. Mm. That's not going to fix anything. Mm -mm. Right. But, but imagine, and we have a colleague that, uh, is also a consultant uh, and uh, works uh, what we shares with us on a, a weekly basis uh, with myself and Horia. And, and sometimes as a consultant, she gets really frustrated because she's hired by organizations and she knows that she can help the organizations to do the right things, to add value, to really um, transform cultures, to change the ways but unfortunately, the expectations from the people that actually signed the contract and hired the consultants are not aligned with really what the company wants. 
It's to cover their own backsides, yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes, and there's, you know, there's a wealth of literature on the uh, agency problem, right? Which is the conflict of interest between the people making the decisions and the organizations themselves, right? Well, imagine if being a consultant, you are hired by someone, and after some analysis, you you realize that the problem of the organization is actually the person that hired you. <laughs> How do you deal with that? <laughs> I'm laughing because it feels so true. I've seen that so many times. <laughs> it's, a, it's an old saying, right? We met the enemy and then enemy is us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if, Horia, if you understand leadership uh, team as, uh, as a maker of good people, if you have a dysfunctional company, well, chances are it's, where is this dysfunction coming from? That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. That's right. And is that, is that poor hiring? <laughs> poor training? Well, poor uh, engaging? All that leans back to the leadership team. It, it becomes a challenge, right? Because we have, again, the Peter principle uh, happening and a lot of people suffering from essentially uh, an inferiority complex because they've been pushed by the system into positions where they don't feel uh, sufficiently competent just yet. And therefore, they see any challenge to their perceived authority um, as a threat, uh, as opposed to practicing humility. And saying, "Okay, uh, let me learn. Let me let me be curious. Uh, let me explore. Why is it that this, what this person said is annoying and irritating me?" And taking that irritation as as a signal to grow and to learn, as opposed to as a signal to uh, exclude, right, and 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 push away. Because fundamentally, that's the challenge with consultancies. As long as we hire tame consultancies that only tell us what we want to hear. <laughs> the panic monster isn't going to come in and dislodge the fun-seeking monkey, right? Because to get better, to get stronger, to get more effective, we can't just follow the, the easy, slow, um, fun path, uh, kind of admiring the flowers here and enjoying some milk and honey over there. <laughs> the universe has a nasty habit of, of not, <laughs> not being arranged that way. <laughs> Right? Hard work and, and toil seems to be the norm in, in order for things to get better over time. Entropy is, is this nasty thing that kind of keeps tearing things down. It's too easy to break things down. It's so much harder to build because we essentially need to challenge each other and say, look, that's not okay. How do we do better? Yeah. So uh, yeah, th that's my hope see, anyway. But... It, it is, but not, it's human nature, right? How many times yeah. I've been, for example, at the gym, 6 a.m., and I see those personal trainers, yeah. and I look at them, and the people that are training, and I say, they're not doing physical training. Mm -hmm. This guy's paying for someone to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, if that's a fair contract and expectation and works for them, I'm all for it. Fantastic. But that's, you know, consultants, managers, um, people that will come in maybe to recover companies. That's why I, I, I put so much attention on the initial discussion, right? The self-reflection of what really do you want? Mm. What is What are the goals? What are the goals? And it goes back to oversight, right? Oversight for what? To see if you're doing your tasks faster <laughs> that that's not the oversight mm -mm. Yeah. that's yeah. bookkeeping you, you know that's i don't know what that is but micromanagement that's, micromanage. <laughs> yeah. that's micromanage, yeah, yeah. right it's it's yeah. it's someone that is running lists that's what it is right someone that runs lists oversight's different is that first first question first question what are we trying to accomplish mm. you start with the what right the why why we're doing this Okay, so yeah. if you start with the why, okay, you, you may you may arrive to you know to the objective in two or three different ways, all of them valid. But if you start with task, task lists, you're not addressing the mm -hmm. why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, <laughs> people keep keep doing. 
tasks and what's without asking why's. Yeah. And leaderships don't even allow for people to ask why. Well, if they're asking why, well, it's because they don't know. Mm. It's actually a failure of leadership. Yeah, what this Your brings to mind for me. Tra- what is that? Yeah, what, what this brings to mind for me are, are two things. Uh, one, you've mentioned it already to start with why uh, in Simon Sinek's work. And the other one is the thick of thin things, as Stephen Covey put it in his Seven Habits um, of uh, Highly Effective People. Um, <laughs> if we allow ourselves to be distracted by busy, 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 uh, let's do the urgent things. Because uh, you ask people and say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. As if that becomes a badge of honor and say, hey, I'm busy, therefore I'm utilized really, really well. Yeah, that's a kind of a key oversight balance in terms of are you optimizing for the flow of value or are you optimizing for the busyness? How utilized are you, <laughs> right? And that kind of ties into the consultancy because, hey, consultants need to make a buck. So therefore they're people from a financial perspective and they need to be well employed such that we don't have people sitting on the bench and not being chargeable right we got to charge <laughs> um, yeah but that's like, you know when you ask why you go from task completion measurement to objective achievement that's right which is radically different that's right right, that's right. different but, mindset you know you you get into this habit of just chasing the actions 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 how many apps and websites we have for action tracking yeah <laughs> a lots of tools these days do right. we have any app for objective tracking like you know long term uh, you we might have or maybe there are <laughs> there are functions well there that's the problem embedded but that's not very popular yeah, well, see, that's the problem. Uh, the objective tracking can hide inside the task tracking because the, the task can be a reflection, a model of the objective. You still have to write it down somehow, but you treat well, it as a task, well done, right? Yeah, exactly. If it's well done, you know, a group of tasks yeah. are part yeah. of the chunk of workable um, objectives that will lead you to your strategic plan. Well, that, I often that... see people stop there. That, that's exactly what Hoshin Kanri and, and strategy deployment is is intended to be all about, right? Except that it's not particularly well practiced. Why? Because it's really hard. Um, so, okay, to 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 kind of bring us to a to a nice close um, on this um, interview. What haven't we asked, uh, Carlos, that we should have? Hmm. You haven't asked. Well, we talked a lot <laughs> about <laughs> many things, right? So, um, well, I, I, I think we covered a lot, but you know, and maybe without you asking, I, I spoke a lot, you know, about the um, the big flaws of um, of uh, leadership, and uh, um, I often feel that this topic. Um, we know we also have we always have like the 10 10 steps to this or that right so the airport literature that will teach you everything right? you need to know about um, leadership but we don't really talk a lot about the flaws of leadership mm. i don't think i don't think so if okay. you do it's briefly and on the way to 10 ways that you can address that often coming from those big four consultancies we just um, talked about, but the real flaws of leadership and start for me with what is the value you add as a leader, as a, as a, as a manager, as a member of a non-productive side of your business. And when I say non-productive, it's not mm-hmm. working yeah, on yeah, the product yeah. itself, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? What do you add? Because what you add needs to be bigger than what you cost. Mm, yeah. And I, I, I don't, really see that kind of uncomfortable discussion um, happening very often. Well, I do think the people that do ask those questions are usually the ones that doesn't last very long in the organization. <laughs> <so>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we, we use the concept of a court jester, 
Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the court jester in, in ancient times was someone employed by the king to, to speak truths uh, in the ear of the king and remind them of their, their mortality and unmask mm -hmm. um, uh, clear uh, abuses of, um, of, of uh, political um, influence, if you will. Uh, but even so, the court jester uh, was intended to be, you know, this is the equivalent of the, the stand-up comic uh, mm -hmm. these days, right? Um, even then, uh, some court jesters uh, were put to death uh, equally so, right? <laughs> How dare king, you? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. When, yeah. the, when the king forgets the, the wisdom of, of confronting their own uh, mortality, you end up with, um, shall we say, totalitarian or worse uh, behaviors. And again, uh, you look at history, you see the uh, five really good Roman emperors. Um, they were really good because they grew up. Um, without uh, the expectation that they will be an emperor. So they had a, a, a rounded um, human development, whereas uh, the more abusive um, emperors um, were, were all kind of born into the purple uh, and therefore ridiculously spoiled and entitled. And it's a very short step to thinking, hey, I'm um, entitled to behave however uh, I feel. They had no empathy, no far more psychopathic behaviors. So I'm personally, I'm really um, intensely interested in how do we inspire more people to practice genuine dialogue and genuine empathy for one another? How do, how do we diffuse intense polarization and, and turn it into uh, a genuine learning uh, about one another and, and with one another in, in search of a better future? Because otherwise, if we get, the, the more intensely we divide ourselves, the, the, the bigger the clash um, is, is going to be when inevitably something's going to break. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. In one word that is easy to pronounce, difficult to practice, compassion. That's right. That's right. Compassion yeah. is awesome. Okay. Um, any uh, closing thoughts, uh, Carlos? No, I just uh, want to thank uh, you, um, Aldo and Horia, for the opportunity. I hope uh, this conversation has been um, interesting for you as it was for me. Outstanding. Um, it's it's been a pleasure. I know um, sometimes I talk a lot, <laughs> but it's just because I'm I'm passionate. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. Uh, appreciate it. Um, I hope you add it. <laughs> sure. Got the excesses. Sure. No, no, it's all good. Uh, it's all good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just a big thank you, and uh, you know, uh, sharing with uh, you, Horia, and now with uh, Aldo has been a, a, a tremendous opportunity for me, and very thankful. Carlos, thank you very much for your time and for your contribution. Um, there's quite a lot of things that um, we have to go think about. Um, thank you for your insights as well. And just a shout out to all our listeners. If you want to participate in, in the debate, in the, the, the discussion, please reach out. Um, at the moment, most of the people we've been interviewing have been from Canada. Come on, other countries step up <laughs> as well. So um, we are please, We're please awful. join the conversation. Thank you very much, Carlos. Yeah. I'm, I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And um, before I close, I'll remind you, uh, leave us a comment or drop us a note. We'll be welcome to have you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.